if you have to lie in order to spread your message, you're not spreading the truth. And that's what makes it so dangerous is that is that they basically take people and they uh, who, who are hungry for that kind of connection and they and they split them off from every other avenue of of relationship and and uh, they make them entirely dependent on the group and that is the sort of behavior that gets you labeled a cult yeah my name is pastor danish house and um, i'm the pastor of new beginnings christian and missionary alliance church in poughkeepsie new york and um we're a a smallish congregation, about 100, 115 people on a given Sunday. Uh, we're in the Hudson Valley of New York, so we're sort of between Albany in the north and New York City in the south, about halfway, half, halfway between the two. Uh, I've been a pastor for 19 years, I guess. I've been in, in full-time ministry for uh, coming up on 30 years, so... So recently you had an encounter with some Shinchanji members or, or the church. Tell us a little bit about that. What happened there? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this topic, but I did have this one contact. Um, uh, and as I was preparing for talking with you, I, I looked back on my messages. It turns out I've had two contacts. Well, there was one contact back in April of last year where someone from the church messaged uh, our church's Facebook account to say, hey, you know, I, I, we want to get in touch with you. We're from the New Heaven and New Earth Church. Uh, nobody saw the message, so I, I never went anywhere. Um, but uh, in, I don't know, September or August of last year, um, we got a phone call from uh, a member of the church. Um, and she was a very nice lady, and she was she was talking, uh, I, I had a chance to talk with her. She was said she's from New Heavens and New Earth, and um, she was, uh, they were uh, looking to connect with local Christian leaders to talk about, um, you know, uh, unity in the body of Christ and talk about uh, how, how we can work together to, uh, to you know, um, build a unified church uh, in the area. Right. And I, honestly, I don't know what was going on in my brain that day, but um, in my head, I, I had connected. I didn't, I didn't connect that it was possibly uh, a fringe group. Um, there are a lot of churches in our area that have, you know, fascinating names. Um, right. I just assumed it was a Christian church from our, our community. And everything that she said sounded like she was a local Poughkeepsie, New York area person. Um, but, uh, and you know what, honestly, uh, one of the things that God has put on my heart is Christian unity. I'm all about, you know, looking for ways that we can partner together with other churches to, to share the gospel. And, and so um, it was something that really rang uh, my bells. It, it, it was, it was mm -hmm. the course I like to ride. So I was like, oh, sure. Yeah, sure. I'll. She was asking if I would, I would be part of a, of a zoom meeting and, and uh, I said, sure. I'd love to talk about that. And I so scheduled an appointment for a, a future date and and uh on that date um i, I sort of thought that it was going to be a bunch of different local pastors talking about this issue and it turned out that it was actually this 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 woman and a, an evangelist from their church um who were who were just talking with me uh sort of two on one and um uh, as I'm talking with them, a couple alarm bells started to go off in the early part of our conversation. And so mm -hmm. I'm here on the computer and I'm <laughs> looking at them on the Zoom and uh, I'm Googling, you know, new heavens and new earth. And, and uh, I had I had Googled when I had talked with them before, I, I Googled new heavens and new earth Poughkeepsie, New York and came up with no hits. So I just thought it was a new sort of new church that was started up in our community. But when they said that the church was uh, was um, headquartered in Korea, um, yeah. it rang a bell for me. I googled New Beginnings. I mean, you googled uh, New Heavens and New Earth, Korea, and came up with all sorts of links about Shincheonji. So as I'm talking with them on the Zoom call, um, I've got now a, a bunch of links on the on the screen. I see. 
that sort of was like, okay, now I get what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're discovering in the midst of the conversation, you're Googling, researching, and you're just, you're finding out, oh, this is, this is a, a highly warned about cult in Korea. And here they are. I'm in the middle of a conversation with them. Yep. So, so what happened then? Did you confront them? Did you just try to get off the conversation or, or what happened then? Neither. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if this is a godly or ungodly character on my part, but I, I kind of, uh, uh, I wanted to give them the opportunity to, to tell me with their own words, the things that I was seeing on the screen. I, I didn't want to, mm -hmm. Honestly, just didn't want to take the word of the internet for it. Yeah, uh, I wanted to hear it from them. So having having some uh, promptings on screen about what some of the things that they might believe, I started to ask questions and um, give them the opportunity to answer those questions. Um, I didn't tell them I didn't tell them that I was had Googled them, but I, I was I was asking them questions that were sort of inspired by my Google browsing and. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to hear it from their own mouths. And uh, what I found was that they were very evasive in the things that they said. So uh, again, that's another warning bell going off in my head that um, when I was asking them fairly direct questions, I wouldn't say confrontational, but direct questions, um, what I was getting back was uh, extremely evasive answers. Yeah. Sometimes it turns out they were lies. Sometimes they gave me direct answers that were lies. Um, but but most of the time it was it was vague, um, tr sort of deflective answers. Mm -hmm. So, as you were talking to them, I know you mentioned there when you you discovered that they originated in Korea. That was a warning bell. But were there other like alarm bells that were going off as you were listening to them? And so I, you know, a lot of the reason I think having this conversation with you is important is because this is happening to not just you know you and your congregation or right. or but it's to pastors all over the country yeah. and so i guess what were some of those alarm bells that were going off in you that you can maybe point out for others to be kind of looking for sure absolutely and and the first the first one was that they were evidently not there to talk about the thing that they had said they were there to talk about so they, they had said that they were there to talk about uh, you know, sort of unity in the body of christ and 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 uh but but here I had I had a sort of practitioner and a and an evangelist, and uh, they were trying to sign me up for uh, you know kind of a, a long term Bible study uh, to uh, sort of and 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 the gist of what this is, so for, I'll, I'll get to the Bible study in just a second, but um, but the fact that that we were not talking about the thing that they said we were going to talk about was sort of my first alarm bell. The second alarm bell was yeah. um, that. Uh, they shared their own personal stories, or at least what they claimed were their own personal stories. Um, I've since learned that that's not all, always the case, that it's not re always really the true story about their lives. But um, the, the stories that they shared were that they, they used to be members of sort of uh, traditional evangelical churches, and uh, but they were they had, they'd gotten sick and tired of uh, their pastors always and they said they said the word interpreting the Bible, and they said they were tired of the of hearing their pastors' interpretations of the Bible. They just wanted to get to know the Bible directly and obey it. Um, mm. And that, from I mean, that's always for me a red flag. When somebody, I mean, when when Christians tell me, "Look, I don't interpret the Bible; I just obey it." Um, that's a that's like a it's like a nuclear bomb of, of alarm bells saying, well, oh, wait a second, uh, something is off here. Uh, because of course you you can't hear something or read something and not interpret it. Like you can't obey something you've not interpreted. So this, this claim to sort of have a direct obedience to scripture rather than kind of a, an interpretation of scripture, it was, yeah. it was a silly kind of bogus claim. Yeah. And by that point I was like, all right, these guys are, these guys are, are off their rocker a little bit. And that was, that's really just one way that they're trying to 
make it out as if, look, we've got the upper hand above, you know, other churches. It's just sort of they're sliding in this this sort of idea of, hey, you know, other churches do it this way. All we want to do, you know, that this sort of false humility is all we want to do is just really yeah. get to what the Bible's actually saying. And it's like some people would fall for that, but sure. but you you oh. kind of and I, I completely understand the impulse of a person who feels like, um, boy, you know, my, my pastor makes understanding the Bible seem complicated, right? I ask him a simple question like, you know, will God protect me from all harm? And, and my pastor gives me an answer that's like, well, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, God does protect his people, but it, it doesn't, doesn't say in the Bible that, that, uh, that we're never going to experience trouble, uh, but Jesus is going to hold us through the trouble. And, and the person's like, wait, 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 I don't want that answer. I want a simple answer. And, um, and so I get the impulse, right? I get why people are attracted to it because they want a simple answer. They want things to be kind of, they don't like nuance. Um, they don't like to sort of right. have, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, the Bible, you know, says one thing in kind of very definitive language here. And then, you know, Jesus will, uh, you know, uh, give three stories to sort of help you kind of understand the limits of what that might be. Um, so I get the impulse and, 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 and you know, it's, a, it's a fair impulse. And, uh, you know, but, I, I, uh, but in reality, um, it's not helpful. Yeah. So what we're... I don't know how much of the specifics of what they were saying that you can remember, but I mean, yeah. I guess you've identified them um, in in your own words as a cult. And so what, what were some of the specifics of what they were saying, what they were teaching yeah. that you, I guess, where you would point out and identify those things as being at odds with the gospel, at odds with a, a you know, a, a good interpretation of scripture yeah so one of the things that they said and they said you know uh we want to we want to just you know read and understand read and obey the bible but they said you know the bible is full of parables and they asked me if i would agree with that do you do you agree that jesus told parables and i said yeah i agree jesus told parables of course jesus told parables um they said yeah so so the bible is full of parables and and you know, i've i've read the bible you know once or twice and and uh and and the bible has a bunch of parables in it um but the, by no stretch of the imagination could you say that the bible is full of parables and so i, I sort of tried to try to push them on that and and it turned out that what they believe is that the bible is almost entirely a parable <laughs> right mm -hmm. it's almost entirely figurative and um mm -hmm. and you know uh, that's that's just not the case uh any fair, plain reading of scripture uh, shows you that the Bible is full of a, a number of different genres, and, yeah. and including uh, including just straight up narrative. Um, the Book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Joshua, Judges, right? Ruth, First Samuel, Second Samuel, and on and on. Yeah. It's not parable. It's 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 narrative. The Gospels are narratives, and um, so. Uh, you know, that was one of the things that they just so sort of trying to trying to say trying to say well, don't you agree that Jesus uh, told parables and yeah of course well then we'll get our nose under the door we'll say well the whole thing's a parable and yeah. and it's not yeah and that's, and, and that's that's sorry that's the that's kind of cults go to thing you know with revelation it, it is the favorite book of of cult groups because yeah. it is because it there is so much figurative language right. and there is so much um you know hyperbolic language and things that can be open to a lot more interpretation and so you can see why they would want to go in the direction of saying hey look the whole bible's a parable because that then gives them this this flexibility in what they do with it and basically they can then it turns it into this like maneuverable play-doh basically where they can just right. form it and shape it into whatever they want it to be right and, and that was their other i mean the other the other one of the other themes of what they said was they were really focused on the book of revelation in our conversation and and uh wanting to and they, they were they were pressing me on whether i believed that uh that jesus was going to return and 
And of course, you know, I said, of course, I believe that Jesus is going to return. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's the basic teaching of the scriptures. And they asked me if, if I believe that we were already in the end times, which I, I talked them through that. I said, well, you know, it says in, you know, second Timothy and elsewhere that, that we're currently living in the last days. Um, but that there's going to be a period of time called the end times near the end. And so there's a distinction in the Bible between are we living in the last days or are we living in the end times? And, and, and uh, I talked about that a little bit. And I talked about how Jesus is, uh, you know, of course, returning at the end of the age. Um, and I started to ask them, you know, do, do you believe that Jesus has already returned? This is, again, I was, I was, I was, um, I was uh, tipped off to this by my Google search, but you know, I asked them, do you believe Jesus has already returned? And they were really, really squishy on that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any Christian group will say, no, I don't believe that Jesus has already returned. You know, we're waiting for the return of Christ, but he hasn't returned. Uh, they were very squishy on it, and they tried to avoid that question. They weren't interested in answering that question. Um, and, you know, I, I found out later that that's because they believe that their chairman, uh, Mon He Lee, in some way is the second coming of, of Jesus. Um, and and you know, I, didn't, uh, I didn't realize that he made that claim fairly explicitly, but during the conversation, until I, later when I, when I researched it, but during the conversation, knowing how these kinds of cults often work, I figured that probably their leader was claiming to be the second coming right. of Jesus. Right. So I, I just kind of tried to push that a little bit and try to figure out if that's what they were really saying. And they were, uh, you know, they told me things I later learned to be were outright falsehoods, right? That they, they were, they were claiming that uh, no, no, he's just a man, you know, whatever. Um, but I learned later that you know Shin Chanji's doctrine is that uh, either he, either he already is sort of embodying the the return spirit of Christ, or mm -hmm. that there will come a day when the the spirit of Christ would return and fill him. Um, and uh, they even what they say directly online is is very squishy about whether they believe that he's already embodying uh, the spirit of Christ or he will embody the spirit of Christ in the future. So yeah, they don't really relation. Yeah, so they don't really um, just kind of come out clearly and and say you know whether or not Christ has returned. Why why do you think it is? I mean. Obviously, we can't know, but what what would be your your guess as you've kind of looked into the script? Why would they do that? What's the motivation there? Well, I mean, if they were to say straight out that Christ has already returned, then they have a lot of problems uh, to answer for any Christian who kind of knows what the Bible says about the return of Christ, right? Um, if Christ has already returned, then you know where where first off, where are the signs of his coming? Secondly. Uh, you know, where is the the peaceable kingdom that he was here to establish? Uh, where is the resurrection of the dead? You know, uh, where is, uh, you know, the this, the judgment and the, and the, the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, why, why does the, I mean, the Bible says that every eye will see Jesus when he returns? Uh, why is not every eye seen him, you know? Um, and, and they also run into the, the major problem that, uh, you know, they claim that, that Jesus uh, rose from the dead as a spirit and uh, is going to return as a spirit. And, his, and that just like they believe that, that Jesus was a man whom, this, whom the spirit of the Son of God, you know, filled or whatever. Mm -hmm. the best. And, and that, it, that that spirit, when Jesus died, when Jesus the man died, that spirit rose and that spirit is going to come and, and going to fill, you know, their chosen pastor, um, in the last in the, in the end times um but they have to really reckon with the fact that the bible says that jesus rose from the dead bodily that he ascended into heaven that uh, the angels who uh, accompanied him told the disciples that he would return in the same way that he ascended as a physical being and he, he talked right. to his disciples and said look here here are my hands here are my feet you know feel me feel my side eat this fish that I've cooked, you know, here, I'll eat some of the fish, right? And, and you know, I mean, there's there's all this uh, testimony in the New Testament about how the Jesus who rose from the dead was a physical being. And um, and that completely runs counter to what they claim about the, the resurrection of Jesus and what they claim about the return of Jesus. So I think that, that if they had been 
um, forthright about what they believed, you know, any Christian uh, who has spent any time uh, in the in the Bible would know that what they were saying was false. So I think they wanted to, and they knew that I was a Christian pastor. Obviously, that's what they're they're, they're targeting Christian pastors, and so I think that they didn't want to get pinned down on something that was obviously false in the first conversation. Yeah, which is a staple of of many cults like this. Anyways, yeah. is is the deceptive practices that they use to get members um, and right. and they justify it in a variety of ways. But that's something that um, I listened to on your YouTube channel, which I can link the, the video where you, I don't know if you have more than one video where you talked about Shin yeah. Ji, but I listened to one of those. Do you have more than one or is it just the one? Yeah. You know, the week after I had this conversation with them, which I eventually I closed the conversation down. Um, as as we had as we the conversation continued, and I asked them questions about swearing loyalty to their founder, um, and they they denied it. They said, "Oh, we don't swear loyalty to anyone." And and uh, you know, eventually I said to them, "Look, um, I, I, I'm always hesitant to say this, but I, I think you're lying to me, and mm -hmm. uh, and I I want you to know that um, I'm concerned for your soul. Uh, if if you believe that you can lie to people in order to uh, win them into the kingdom, uh, you know, you're running afoul of what the apostle Paul said in the second Corinthians, where he was talking about how we have renounced deceitful underhanded ways. Uh, we are not allowed to use lies to spread the gospel. And if you believe that you can lie to me, uh, that's uh, in order to, you know, win me over to your cause, then, you know, your soul is at risk. And as a pastor, I just want to tell you that I'm, I'm very concerned uh, for your spiritual well-being, and and I would urge you to to look at what you're doing because uh, it's it's sin. And mm -hmm. so, I, so they said they said, oh well, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I guess that's not what we're doing. And I'm like, no, yeah, I think it is. And and uh, I said, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but uh, I think it is what you're doing. And and uh, so I'm I'm going to close the conversation down right now. And so so we did close the conversation at that point. Um, at, afterwards, I felt like it was important for me to let my church know uh, that these folks are, you know, they're patrolling in the area, that they're, mm -hmm. uh, they're making phone calls here. And so um, I sent out an, uh, a message to my congregation through email. And then uh, the following week, uh, I do a daily devotional video for the folks in my congregation that I put up on our Facebook uh, wall and I put it up on YouTube. And so I, I recorded five uh, daily videos about Shinchanji and about the conversation that I had, uh, but also about some of the things that I learned through through research. That was uh, August, was it August 29th, 30th, 31st, September 1st, and September 2nd on our YouTube okay. channel. Um, and I, honestly, I had no thought that it would go anywhere beyond our congregation. Um, I, I'm just a little dumpy little pastor in a small <laughs> church in in uh, in the cabin in the Hudson Valley of New York. I, I'm just a guy who's trying to tell his, his congregation what's going on and, and mm -hmm. help warn people. But it turned out actually that we had some people who watched those videos uh, from actually a lot farther away <laughs> than Poughkeepsie. Yeah. Um, so talk about that a little bit. What who, who was it that ended up finding your videos? Yeah, so I got a. Um, I was recording these videos day by day, and um, and I put up I think Monday the Monday video and the Tuesday video, um, and uh, I and it was, must have been Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. I got a Facebook message from a fella in India, and he's a pastor in India, and he said he said I just did a a search on Facebook for Shinchanji, and your video was the top of the list, and I was like. Okay, what he said? What do you? What is Shinchanji a cult? He asked. And I said, Well, they don't like the uh, they don't like the word cult, but um, they're at at best they're a a false heretical uh, um, alternative Christian movement. And mm -hmm. uh, and he said, well, I he said to me, I he said I I'm at uh, or I, I was just at today a. Um, an event that Shinchanji held in my area in India, he said, where they had invited all the local pastors to come and 
uh, they were they were trying to sign pastors up for a uh, for a, a, a I don't guess a six month Bible study uh, to sort of train them and prepare them give them theological training for their work as pastors and he said I didn't I never heard of this group before so I you know I searched on Facebook the name Shinchanji and your video came up and I, I, he said there were some things that were sort of strange to me so I wanted to make sure if they were if they were uh, really a Christian movement he said and, and I watched your videos and I'm really glad because uh, there were a lot of pastors he said, he said thousands it was, it was over a thousand pastors were at this gathering and uh, and Shinchanji was offering them money to take this Bible training course, you know, and he said, he said, Pastor House, you know, you don't understand how uh, impoverished we are here in terms of pastors. Of pastors here oftentimes are, uh, you know, working at an outside job in order to pastor, and they're not being paid very much and or at all by the church, and it's very difficult to get good theological training. Mm -hmm. So we're we're desperate for good training here, and when if someone offered to pay you money to take a Bible course, you know, wouldn't you say yes? Uh, and oh boy, my heart went out to him. <laughs> I was like, yeah, 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 brother. You know, I, he said, he said, I, I said, I'm going to go and tell these guys that, uh, that this is a cult. He said, and, and, uh, he said, please, uh, you know, he said, I, I can't wait for your other videos. And he and I have actually have an ongoing correspondence, uh, since then. Great. Well, that's, that's awesome. I, I'm so glad you're doing that and you don't, with the crazy world that we live in with YouTube now, it's just you don't know who the video is going to impact, who it's going to reach. Um, but it, but it's also what a great opportunity to help other people and to, you know, there's people that might get into your situation and be coerced and manipulated into it. And so, I mean, if, you know what, the thought that comes to my head is if they are targeting pastors in this way, my, my, impulse thought would be like, well, you're just, you're kind of wasting your time. Like you're not, sure. that's not really a great place to focus. Like most pastors are going to, you know, have those warning signs and those red flags. But if they are doing that and uh, it, it would seem like they must be having some success. Um, yeah. And that, so that was mystifying to me too. And, and, and I, you know, I, I thought, um, I mean, my hope is, and maybe I'm wrong, but my hope is that, you know, pastors of, of evangelical churches in America would be sort of the most theologically literate, the most biblically understanding folks, uh, right. that they, and, and would have the most warning signs. What it looks a little terrifying to me if, if they're finding, uh, you know, fruitful hunting ground among the pastors of yeah. America, um, that would be, that's a terrifying thought to me. And yeah, um, that's concerning. Yeah. Um, you know, but I do know that uh, from you know from listening to the testimony of of ex Shinchanji members in this country and in other countries online, is that they really are targeting people with a hunger to know the Bible, and mm -hmm. um, you know that describes the people of my congregation. <laughs> and so, I, I, my hope is that that our ministry here at the church is is providing them with a you know rich buffet of Bible teaching and, and study. Um, but it's entirely possible that uh, that there's there are churches out there that aren't doing that and that, that aren't providing yeah. as much Bible teaching and Bible instruction and, and conversations around the Bible as as people are hungry for. And if that's the case, if we're not doing it, then somebody else is going to step in and fill that void and and they're not going to be good people. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. gonna be followers of Christ. It's going to be, it's going to be, and I said good people, you know, obviously I'm sure there's good people who are in Chan, Chan, Chan Ji and, and there's bad people who are in my, in our churches, you know? So, uh, but it's not going to be doctrinally, uh, theologically, uh, Orthodox Christians. Uh, if, if, the, if, if it's not theologically Orthodox Christians who are offering good Bible study, then, then who's gonna, it's going to be the cults and they're going to come in and they're going to, you know, pull our people away uh, by offering them what they're hungry for and, and we're not providing. Yeah. And, you know, that's why, again, I think 
you're the second pastor I've talked to who's had a encounter with with this group and the the one before had a bit of a more unfortunate situation where they more or less infiltrated his church and then begun to you know bring members of the congregation out into their their group but um i I was speaking to somebody recently um about another cult called the world mission society church of god and these cults are very similar but one of the things he said about you know, spreading awareness about doing videos like this and the importance of it that that stuck with me. And I thought it was a great point is it's kind of like kind of like vaccinating people um, and vac- vaccinating is kind of a triggering sort of thing right now. But but, you know, when you think about what um, we, you know, making videos like this can do, having conversations like this, the videos you put out is it's, you know, people who are hungry. Uh, they're going to be susceptible to kind of eating up whatever is, you know, given to them that at least on the surface appears to be deep and, and have this profound sort of insight into the Bible. And so just making people aware that there are groups out there like this that are, you know, targeting pastors, targeting uh, congregation members and, yeah, in, in that sense, vaccinating people so that when they, they do, by chance encounter uh, SCJ or, or any other cult group. Um, they have that sort of, uh, you know, preemptive awareness of it so that their red flags and their warning signs will go off and, you know, they'll have those defenses up. Um, so um, with that, I will, I do want to, I'll, I'll try to find your videos. I, I, again, I think I found the first one, so I'll make sure to link those um, in this video for anybody who wants to watch, um, because I think we need we need as much stuff like this out there as possible. Well, um, I I watched, I've watched your, your channel, and I really did appreciate your interview with the other pastor, and and uh, you know, I think you're doing a great job uh, in, in helping to sort of inoculate people against uh, the, the incursion of, of these groups. Um, and uh, and they are here, you know, and they are, they are active. Mm-hmm. I you talk about the World Mission Society Church of God. Um, they came knocking on my door at, at, <laughs> at my house a few years oh, ago did they? before the pandemic. And, um, you know, two by two walking through my neighborhood and, you know, trying to engage people in conversation. And, uh, you know, the, very attractive young man, a very attractive young lady, and they're you know, dynamically interesting people, and you know, dressed mm-hmm. really snazzy, and and trying to trying to uh, you know engage people on questions about the end times and about uh, for in their case it was about communion. They want to talk about communion for some reason, uh, but uh, yeah, so I, they're here and they're they're active. Whether it's Shinchanji or the World Mission Society. Uh, Church of God, or whether it's uh, you know the Unification Church, which they spring from, or or any of the others, you know, there's there's just uh, they're everywhere. <laughs> they're yes, everywhere. yeah. So what I guess what would you say um, in defining them as a cult? Why is it that you would define them as a cult? Why is it that you would look at groups like this and even have the motivation to want to warn people? You know, why is it that this is okay? Well, this is, you know, someone's have sort of the the idea of you know, well, this is just you know another church. Why 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 is this a thing to warn people about? Just let them do what they do, and you go on doing what you do. Why why the need to even warn people about these kind of groups? What is it about them that is concerning and and dangerous? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, I'm I'm using the word cult um, kind of freely. Um, It's a word that Shinchanji does not like to have used towards them. And, you know, maybe out of respect for them as as human beings, I might refrain from using that word, but but they certainly are a, a fringe religious group um, what, what makes them dangerous and what makes it difficult is that um, when people start in on uh, in this group, they're, they're initially they're treated very kindly, they're warmly welcomed, they're made to feel like part of a, you know, a new family, which is wonderful. Um, uh, but then they start to drive a wedge between those people and their families. They try, they start to draw a wedge between them and their friends and, and to, to, teach them that um, 
that their friends and family won't understand the fact that they're part of this group. They'll try to get you out of the group. Um, so you need to lie to your family and friends. You need to lie to the people in your church. Um, and it's okay. You can lie to them for the sake of the gospel, right? But for the sake of, if you tell a lie in the service of the truth, it's okay. And so mm -hmm. you try to persuade people that um, they can, they can, they can be deceptive and, and that, that deception that they have, you know, puts a wedge between people in their relationships with their family. It divides them from their friends until eventually the, the, the group is all they have, right? I mean, they don't have other people in their life anymore as they've been driving people away. And, um, and, and that's, that's just a dangerous place to be. And, and oftentimes that is the point at which a lot of uh, members of the group start to realize, wait a second, something sick has happened here. But sometimes not, right? I mean, there's a there's a, a sunk cost fallacy, you know, that says, "Hey, I've I've put a lot of time and a lot of money into this. Um, you know, it can't be wrong. <laughs> if mm -hmm. it's wrong, I've really wasted my time. Uh, I don't want to believe I've wasted my time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pressing on." Um, but as they you know, as they divide you from your friends and your family, as they cut you off from uh, from the relationships that really nourish you, uh, you start to to trust them and only them. And, and frankly, in the end, uh, you're swearing loyalty to Reverend Monhee Lee uh, mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, to a Jesus who unites you to, who unites you to your family. You're swearing yourself to Monhee Lee who divides you from your family. And, and um, you know, uh, we are not supposed to swear allegiance to any person on this earth. Uh, you know, our allegiance is to Jesus and to Jesus alone. And when we and when we're united to Christ, you know, He comes in and He works in our families and He helps our families. and And His interest is in is in winning our families to Christ, not through deceitful and underhanded means, but through an open presentation of the gospel. Um, if you have to lie in order to spread your message, you're not spreading the truth. Um, and, and that's what makes it so dangerous is that, is that they basically take people and they, uh, who, who are hungry for that kind of connection and they, and they split them off from every other avenue of, of relationship and, and, uh, they make them entirely dependent on the group. And that is the sort of behavior that gets you labeled a cult, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. that's the sort of behavior that, uh, makes you, uh, you know, a totalizing experience. Um, and that's, that's, that's dangerous. It's unhealthy. And, uh, and it winds up wrecking people's lives, right? If you, uh, I, I think all of us, you know, have some beliefs that when we wind up standing before the, the throne of Christ and all is revealed on the last day, we'll be like, Oh, I can't believe I believed that. <laughs> that was, I wasn't quite right about that. Um, and so I think we've all got some beliefs in our lives that are, are probably not true. Uh, we all, we, we do interpret the Bible. You have to interpret the Bible. You can't not interpret the Bible. Um, and, and, you know, I, I bet some, some of the things I believe about the Bible are probably wrong. Um, but I, when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, um, dressed in his righteousness alone, um, those things will drop away. But, when 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 you're when you're sucked into this group and they make you swear allegiance to at the end to swear allegiance to Monhe Lee, you are clothing yourself in Monhe Lee rather than in Jesus. It is not Monhe Lee who saves, because Monhe Lee is not Jesus, and uh, he's not the second coming of Jesus. He's not Jesus's chosen pastor, and uh, it's it's dangerous in this world because it splits you off from your relationships, but it's also dangerous uh, at the judgment. And, and uh, so that's why I'm concerned. I don't want, I don't want the people that I love to be uh, sucked away into a group that will endanger their lives here on earth and endanger their, their eternal souls in the future. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Arminian in my theological beliefs. Uh, I, I, um, I hold to the pre-wrath version of the rapture. I, uh, 
uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I believe in, in believer's baptism rather than pedo baptism, right? There's different theological beliefs that I have, but I, mm -hmm. I look at people who disagree with me in the church and I say, look, okay, we disagree. You're a Calvinist, I'm an Arminian. We're both Christians, you know, um, we both, we both follow the same Christ, you know, uh, one of us is probably right. One of us is probably wrong. I'm probably right. You're probably wrong, but um, yeah, obviously, <laughs> but, you know, but regardless, uh, when we get before the judgment seat of Christ, that disagreement will fade away um, because we'll be there in the light of Jesus and, and he will be the one that we see. Um, whether you believe in infant baptism or adult baptism, that'll fade away. Whether you believe, you know, whatever your, your sort of the second order beliefs are. Um, but whether or not Jesus is your savior, that's, that's the question <laughs> that doesn't fade away. That's the question that actually is the foundation for eternal life. And, and uh, when I see people uh, being drawn away to swear loyalty to Monhee Lee, uh, it breaks my heart. Yeah. So there's those two dynamics there. There's the spiritual danger, the spiritual uh, harm that is done to people. The, the, and there's, there's, you know, I, I agree with that distinction between, you know, things that could be categorized as secondary issue, you know, like whether you are um, your, your stance on the specifics of baptism, but there are specific things like whether or not a, you know, a Korean man is the Jesus who you should give your allegiance to, or at least on that level or not, you know, those are more issues that that's going to, you know, that, that has a bigger impact. And so it's the spiritual side, but, but the physical, you know, this, the, the aspect of how it affects you in this world. And, and ultimately what they do, what groups like this do is they, they get control, you know, all these things that you've talked about, it comes down to, you know, the, the seclusion from your family and, you know, them trying to get you to avoid doing the research on the internet. Don't Google us. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all about, they want to have full control over you, over your decisions, over yeah. where you spend your time, where you spend your money. Uh, it's for their benefit. They, it's all for their own agenda and benefit, which is just, you know, evil. Um, but um, yeah, so. And you know, I'll tell you well, one thing I don't know. And one thing I keep wondering about this, this whole thing is, you know, in, in most cases, I won't, I want to say all cases, but I don't know all cases, but most cases uh, when these groups split you off and, and make you have kind of this sole allegiance to their church, um, it's because they want to control you for the purposes of money mm -hmm. or sex um, or just a, a feeling of power. And I have no idea if, if that is actually going on in Shinchanji. But you know what? Um, it happens all the time everywhere else. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if, if, if you know, Man He Lee or the, the heads of Shinchanji are, are making themselves rich off of this. Uh, but I tend to believe that when the books are open, we'll find out that that's kind of part of the motive. I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, money, sex, and power tend to be behind this desire to uh, separate people off from uh, and, and gain complete control over them. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was something yes. that was going on here as well. Me either. So you talked, would you... Would you talk a little bit again about the Second Corinthians four verse? Because I, that was another thing that stood out to me that I I listened to in in your video, and I just think that's such a huge point. Um, and that 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 simple statement of Paul there, um, I might even read through it real quick. But yeah. it you know deception and manipulation is, is such a huge part of how. The World Mission Society, Church of God, and Shinchanji groups operate, and 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 their methodology of getting new members. Um, so, Second Corinthians four, what Paul says is, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning, or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, Amen. we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. 
And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So like taking that statement of Paul, why, why is it that that statement strikes you um, and, and stood out to you as you were sort of discovering what Shinjanji is, is all about? Yeah, you know, this is a, a, a question that's so much on my heart uh, these days because um, you know, I, 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 today I was, I was having lunch with a, a friend who um, had a, has had a really hard time in a Christian church uh, and has, has become very disillusioned uh, with mm -hmm. Christianity because of, uh, of in his church uh, is, is in a place where uh, there, there were Christians using uh, deceitful, underhanded ways and were mm -hmm. uh, sort of, uh, using sort of power grab kind of politics in the church to, to establish their own kingdom on this earth. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to him that I was, you know, be having this conversation and he's like, he's like, I said, I said, cause you know, we, we renounce deceitful and underhanded ways. And he said, do we, do we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay, well we should. <laughs> Paul, Paul wants us to, to renounce yeah. deceitful and underhanded ways. And, you know, unfortunately I see, I see some in the, in the Christian church using uh, power grab techniques as a way to build their, their congregations. Um, but, you know, the concern that Jesus has is for the vulnerable, right? Jesus said, uh, you know, that, that those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, and I, and I, you know, I've come to seek and save the lost. You know, God, Jesus came into this world to seek and save the lost, and and He wants to tenderly lead the sheep. He He wants to bind up those who are wounded and take care of those uh, who have been injured uh, by the world, and and. It just uh, it drives a stake into my heart to see people taking advantage of vulnerable people. Look, we're all we're all and part of what Jesus is saying is that uh, the undertone of what Jesus is saying is that we're all in need of a physician, right? There's, there's not any healthy people, um, and and so we look out there and and there's tons of people willing to take advantage uh, of our vulnerabilities. Whether it's you know uh, some internet scam or you know uh, uh, some politician making claims that they'll never uh, fulfill, uh, or or whether it's a cult that's coming in and saying you know here you know we're going to be your friends and your family, uh, even as they're driving you away from the the real friends and real family that you have, um, using underhanded means, using deceitful, cunning tactics uh, to gain a hold of whatever vulnerability you have. Um, it's a misuse of power. It's a misuse of authority. It's a misuse of, of, of the scriptures, ultimately. And that's what Paul says, right? He says, uh, but we don't tamper with God's word, right? Mm -hmm. We don't tamper with God's word. Um, Jesus has concern for us in our vulnerabilities, and he wants to tenderly, take care of us rather than to take advantage of us and to, and to gain power over us. And so, you know, whenever I see abuse of power, whenever I see people manipulating other people, whether it's in the Christian church or in one of these alternative groups, um, it breaks my heart uh, because we're supposed to use whatever influence or power we have to serve others, not to manipulate and take advantage of them. And, uh, and, and ultimately, um, you know, we're, we're living in a world where uh, you got to be on your toes every minute because people are trying to scam you. And, and I hate to see that being done in the name of Jesus. Um, it gives a bad name to those who are legitimately preaching the gospel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like how you pointed out that this isn't exclusively a, a cult problem or, or a problem with these, you know, s sort of side uh, churches and organizations, but this is, this is just a human thing. You know, it, it's, it, it's a, this comes down to, you know, the difference between true Christianity and someone that is false is ultimately it's about what's, what's at the heart of like, what's at the core of this and love, goodness, truthfulness, uh, you know, the fruit of the spirit, like these are the things that Christianity as it really is, true Christianity should produce, you know, a, a to actually 
come in contact with Jesus, who is life, should produce something that is alive, not something that looks like, you know, how a, a powerful business organization or, or a military regime, you know, would operate in, in their quest for control and power. You know, it should look different. And so that's why I think, yeah, I, I like how you emphasize Second Corinthians 4, because that's kind of what Paul's emphasizing the fact that the way that the the apostles who had this message, how they operated was different. It looked different. It, it's light, the contrast of light versus darkness. Uh, it's, it's um, and yeah, so I think that's just, people need to look at that. And that's maybe even harder sometimes to pick up on than, than theological error is, uh, you know, um, moral error, the way people are, um, I guess just the fruit, the fruit, what is, what is manifesting, you know, what does Shinchanji cause to manifest in the, in a person's character. And uh, exactly as you're saying, if what is manifesting from it is lies and deceit and manipulation, uh, you know, I, I think you said it so clearly, like if you're, I can't remember exactly how you worded it, but something to the extent of if you're claiming that you're out preaching the truth and you're using lies to do it, I mean, isn't that in itself, does it that say at all? And, you know, uh, I would say to somebody, if, if there's somebody watching this video and you're you're just sort of dabbling in Shinchanji, you're starting, just starting to get your, your feet wet in it or somebody's just inviting you to think, I would just say, you know, ask yourself here at the front of this, you know, who do I want to be uh, mm. at the end of this? You know, do I want to be a person who is lying to their family and friends in order to, you know, <laughs> maintain my beliefs? Uh, I don't think there's very many of us that set out and say, well, my goal today is to is to lie to my family and friends. Uh you know, we get we get we get twisted into it either by our own sinful desires or by other people who, you know, uh, want to use us for their sinful desires. And and uh, you know, if there's somebody who's watching this video and you're just sort of getting invited to these things and you're like, well, oh, they seem nice now. I just let you know that there is going to come a time when you're going to be asked to lie to your friends and your family to to avoid the truth, to avoid information, to to keep keep away from, you know, Googling Shinchanji or whatever. And, and then also to tell your family and friends that you're, you're just involved in a regular old Bible study. Um, and, uh, you know, the truth is that there are, that, that the leaders, there's likely that some of the leaders are lying to you about their own story. Um, and they're going to get you, they're going to encourage you to lie to others. Is that really who you want to be? Is that really, mm. you know, developing the character in you that, that Jesus wants in you or that you want in you. you know, I think we all want to be truthful people. It hurts to lie. It, it feels sick and it feels dirty. It feels yucky to lie. Our, our consciences bother us because you know, God has built a universe in which truth matters. And truth matters to our, our, our soul. It, it, you know, lying eats away at our, our bodies and our souls. Uh, you don't want that. Um, I don't want that for you. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, get out of that uh, right away. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where someone is telling you that in order to spread the truth, you need to lie. And what, one thing that I, I, I would want to emphasize too is I think one of the things that frustrates and pains me, you know, more than a lot of things that I see going on uh, with, with these cult groups is, you know, I, I understand people who have encountered these groups, been involved with these groups, spent years in these groups, and they walk away from that and say, I don't, I don't want anything to do with religion or God right now. I, I, I understand that. But what I, what I hope that people will see, what I want people to see, you know, is what I've experienced, not that, you know, the, there's, there's issues with my own beliefs that I've had to discover and had to, to deal with. And, you know, in evangelical Christianity, but what I've seen, even just looking at the scripture, looking at Jesus, looking at what is supposed to be the result in the change of heart in a person who is actually walking with him is that there's a, again, there's a stark contrast between 
what the the god of these groups is like his character his his attitude his thoughts toward you is is so dramatically different uh than what you know is actually communicated in in scripture and then with that the you know so many people it sounds like even maybe this friend who you're talking about who's having issues with the church you know they experience people and it's so easy, I think, to attribute, oh, if this Christian or this person who claims to be walking um, in accordance with the Bible, if they're behaving this way, well, I don't want anything to do with God or the Bible. Um, and so I, I just I would hope people would understand that there is there is a difference there. And, and I've seen the difference between what is produced in somebody who is really actually following Jesus in a humble, truthful way and one who is in error. Yeah. And the, it's just the difference between light and darkness is the difference between something that is living and true and you encounter it. And it, it just, you know, like Jesus, it, like the Psalm says, like taste and see that the Lord is good. And so yeah. there is that tasting when you taste the real thing. Um, when you taste the real thing, you, you don't have to understand the ins and outs of SCJ to realize, oh, this is not the true thing because because this smells wrong, this tastes wrong. Um, and so I don't know exactly what I'm saying there other than just to encourage people to, to, um, to realize that I think there is something so much more beautiful and good in what Jesus and what the New Testament is, is communicating and what, you know, what it looks like and is supposed to look like to follow Jesus, to, um, to, you know, proclaim the, the truth. And so don't, I think just don't do the, the whole throw the baby out with the bathwater sort of thing, as I think is the temptation to do in these situations. Yeah, I definitely. And, and, you know, I, I, I do feel for everybody who is, who has been hurt by the church? You know, I, these the Shinchanji members who who were trying to recruit me. You know, they they each told a story from their their own perhaps their own upbringing, where uh, where they you know were part of a church and uh, they felt like uh, they were getting the pastor's opinions rather than the truth, and that drove them away from uh, from their churches. Um, so they they're telling a story that is you know that describes uh what a lot of people experience right a lot of a lot of people experience uh, a hurt from the church and um and and i i feel for them and and i i recognize i've i've been a pastor for for 18 years whatever 19 years um, i've been in full-time ministry for almost 30 um I've experienced hurt from the church too, you know, it's mm -hmm. real. Um, but, uh, but, but what's more real than that, or, or as real as that is Jesus, right? I mean, uh, Jesus is, is real and true and good. And, um, and he is gentle and kind and loving. He tells the truth um, and calls us to be gentle, kind, and loving and tell the truth. And, um, you know, uh, Jesus is good. And, and and to anybody who's been hurt by the church, I would say I'm so sorry for what you've been through. But uh, and no, 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 but I'm sorry for what you've been through. Period. End of sentence. Uh, but I also would say that, that Jesus is still good. And um, ultimately, and the, the tough part, I think, from a human standpoint, is that Jesus loves the church. And uh, and so as you get closer to Jesus, he he helps you to love the church. Um, but, uh, but sometimes, you know, you get hurt by the people you love <laughs> and, and, and that, that is, that's, it's not, it's not, uh, in the plan, uh, except that, uh, you know, one of the things I keep telling my, my folks is that, um, Paul, uh, gives us, and Jesus and Paul give us a lot of one another statements in the new Testament. You love one another, forgive one another, bear with one another, uh, all these sorts of things. And, and uh, that's sort of the what Christian mature growing Christian maturity is exercising these one another statements, and uh, you know we wouldn't be called to bear with one another if there were no 
problems in the church, right? I don't have to bear with someone that I fully agree with and who never hurts me, right? Mm -hmm. I only have to bear with someone who has hurt me, uh, or I only have to bear with someone who's who is annoying, right? Or I disagree with. Um, I don't have to forgive. We don't have to forgive one another if there's nothing to forgive. Um, somehow, it's not God's plan that we would hurt one another. But in God's plan, he takes the fact that we hurt one another and redeems it. Right? He takes that and uses that as uh, as the foundation for Christian maturity. And and um, so you know, to anybody who's been hurt by the church, what I would say is, uh, I'm sorry that that's been the case. I feel for you. Um, and I would encourage you to look to Jesus and he will love you and care for you. And he'll help you to get to the point when you're able to forgive. Uh, and able to help others who've been hurt as well. Um, there is good stuff in the church, uh, and and Jesus is in the church, and it's worth finding him. So what advice would you give then to to pastors? Because I think giving a, a warning in a sense, uh, a big part of what I hope this video would, would be is just serve as a warning um, to other pastors, to other leaders who might not only a warning to them personally that, hey, you might encounter these people, they might try to manipulate you into joining, but that a warning to these pastors as well that, hey, you need to keep an eye on, you know, people in your congregation and maybe consider, you know, giving a five or 10 minute uh, uh, informational about, hey, this these kind of groups uh, are out there and, and, and this is how they operate. You, these are the warning signs and just be aware, kind of an encouragement maybe to give that vaccination. So I guess what would you say to to other pastors, you know, in, in relation to all this? Yeah, I, I'd say none of us, I mean, for very few of us want to spend the majority of our time talking about the 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 fringe groups, right? We don't, that's, that's not where we want to spend our time. We want to spend our time talking about Jesus and, and about the about, about the truths of scripture rather than the lies that people tell. But, but you can't do the one without doing the other. Right? I mean, the, the, um, the, the job of elders and pastors among them is, is to teach the truth and to refute those who oppose it, right? That's what it says, that's what Paul says. So uh, if that's the case, if that's our job, then we're not doing our job if we don't uh, refute those who oppose it, right? We, we, we have to be equipped. We have to be ready to uh, to not just teach the truth, but also to show the difference between truth and error. Uh, I appreciate the sentiment behind the, the illustration that pastors often give about counterfeit money and saying, oh, you know, if you want to if you want to, the, the, when they train people to detect counterfeit money, they don't teach them about counterfeits, they teach them about real money. Uh, it's not true. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the sentiment behind it, but it's not true. The truth is that if they want to teach you to, to spot counterfeits, they show you the mistakes counterfeiters often make. And so, uh, you know, we want to spend our time and our heart is to spend our time talking about the truth. And we should spend the bulk of our time talking about the truth. But you can't talk about the truth without also contrasting it with error. And, and, uh, and you're not doing your people any favors if you're not uh, if you're not preparing them for what they will encounter, I, I, like I said, this Worldwide Mission Society Church of Christ, they were they came knocking on my door, and they didn't just knock on my house door; they had knocked on everybody's house's door. Um, you know, they're they're coming around in our neighborhoods, and they're they're trying to win converts. And uh, you know, I see uh, there's I, I see this one one uh, fringe group has a a stand set up at the the corner near me. Uh, every single day, uh, trying to talk to college students and others. Um, you know, they're out there trying to uh, trying to, to win people over. And if you're not warning your people, which you need to do, uh, then you're doing them a disservice. You need to teach the truth. You need to contrast it with error. You need to provide your people with the uh, the rich Bible teaching that their hearts are hungering for. Uh, whether it's in the form of Bible studies or, or sermons or, uh, you know, what have you, one-on-one uh, -on -one discipleship, you got to, you really got to feed, uh, you know, give them access to the words so that they're, they're able to be fed spiritually so they're not 
tempted to go astray in, in these things. But it's not just your people either. I mean, that's one of the things that's, that's key to understand is that, you know, while we do as pastors have primary, you know, responsibility to feed the flock that's under our care, we also live in communities that are where, where vulnerable people are being uh, drawn in by these groups. And, and if, you know, if Shinchanji is visible in our community, if the Worldwide Mission Society, uh, you know, Church of God is visible in our community and we're not, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, we've got Jesus, <laughs> you know, we've got the scriptures. Uh, you know, why are we not uh, sharing the gospel with, with people on, a re on the regular? Yeah, I'm not saying that knocking on doors is the best way to do it, but, um, but sometimes it may be, you know? Uh, we got to be about the about the business of, of preaching the gospel and you know teaching the scriptures to those within the, within our walls, preaching the gospel to those within our walls, uh, but also reaching out beyond our walls because uh, you know we want Jesus, we want, we want the vulnerable out there to find the real Jesus, and not for the vulnerable out there to find some you know white suited uh, pretender. Mm -hmm.